So I'd now like to call up uh, Mr. Daryl O'Callaghan to um, present to us. So Daryl is a, a real success story of modern medicine. After a major trauma where he was given little chance of survival, Daryl also is a picture of reality of recovery from critical illness. He's a consumer advocate within CRE Reduce and is passionate about improving communication between the healthcare system and particularly the patients of uh, the families of patients as well. So, Daryl. Well, good morning, everybody, and. Uh... Firstly, thank you for the opportunity, Jason, to speak this morning. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, down at our local park and uh, with my two daughters, Sienna and Mila, little six and three-year-old, watching them run around. That was in the moments they weren't trying to kill their dad with overzealous enthusiasm, which uh, was always a, a constant problem for me. And uh, I was thinking about it that day. It was a Sunday, and, and I was thinking six years previous, it was a very different day for me. Uh, that day I was uh, heading out on a motorbike ride with a, a group of my friends. We were heading out to Mount Me. And just before we came to Debra, we were going around a slight bend in the road. And as we came around the bend in the road, I noticed there was a car coming towards us. And it uh, had, an old, it had a, a large car trailer on the back of the car. And on top of that car trailer was an old Holden Kingsford. And as we came around the bend, the driver of the uh, car lost control of the, the trailer and it jackknifed into our lane. And we're doing, I think, something like about 100 kilometres an hour at the time, which is the legal speed limit, I should point out. And uh, we, it happened so quickly, we didn't have a chance, so I didn't certainly have a chance to touch my brakes. And so if you look at the, the accident scene here, uh, I've hit the trailer and I've been catapulted over the top and I've landed on the armour guard rail on the other side and then bounced back onto the road. And my friend Andy, uh, who's in the foreground of the shot there, uh, he, he bounced back several metres from the impact. So as you can imagine, 100 kilometres an hour and a sudden stop uh, creates a lot of carnage. So at the accident scene, I think there was something like, I'm told this, of course, because I have a great recollection of it, there was something like eight or nine uh, paramedics that attended the site, uh, and including an emergency doctor. And because of the extensive nature of, of our injuries, uh, the decision was made uh, at the time to, to place me in a juice coma. And from there, I was transferred um, to here, the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital, as a, um, a red blanket. So I'm not sure if you all know what that means, but that red blanket protocol means that due to the serious nature of my injuries, and I was basically clinging to life, that once I arrived here at the hospital, I bypassed triage through emergency and I was straight into theatre and the doctors, the surgeons there already had information from the field uh, that I had significant internal bleeding and so they were ready to operate once I arrived. So the list up there, and I won't try and go through it all, but basically um, there wasn't too much of me that wasn't broken, I wasn't damaged. And so this sort of upper quadrant, right quadrant of my body, if you like, was basically crushed from the impact. So... Uh, for me, the thing that probably stood out was the fact that I, could, I was barely able to breathe. So the significant damage to my lungs made that quite difficult. Uh, obviously, because the, the organ damage, I uh, was bleeding internally, significantly, and externally. And the issue, for, I think, is that um, if you look at that injury, and I'm not a doctor, of course, but that list there, there's probably um, any one of several of those injuries was enough to kill me by itself, let alone having them all at the same time. So doctors work feverishly through. Um, this was in the afternoon. I would have arrived. I think the accident was about 12.30 in the day. And, you know, from what I'm told, uh, I died several times on the operating theatre. In the operating theatre, sorry. And after several hours of trying to, to pull him back together to try and stop the bleeding, it got to a point where surgeons decided that uh, there wasn't much more they could do at that point. And so I was transferred back to ICU. And that's where basically my family was told um, by doctors that due to the extensive nature of my injuries, um, that it was unlikely that I was going to survive that uh, through the night. Now, at this point in time, my wife, uh, Julie, is overseas in France, holidaying with her, her Belgian family, and she had a 10-month-old baby daughter with her. And so she hadn't, she, they hadn't been able to get onto her at this stage, my family. So... She received a phone call from my father, and it was at that point that she was told that you know, Daryl's been involved in a terrible accident, and he's not expected to make it for the night. So then she had to jump on a plane and travel 30 hours back with our 
baby daughter, expecting that when she arrived here in Brisbane that she would be greeted by news that, that I'd passed away. Fortunately, um, as you can see, I didn't pass away. Uh, surgeons, there was a, a group of surgeons decided that maybe there was still hope and they took me back later that night, I think it was around about midnight, and uh, had a second, performed a second operation on me. And that's where they found that I had a, a tear to my heart. And that was the, the missing piece, the jigsaw puzzle. And they uh, repaired that tear. And that gave me the first chance of getting through that. So that gave me a chance of getting through the night. But that was the first day in a very long journey. So I spent a total of 35 days in an ICU. Three of those weeks were in an induced coma. And obviously, you saw the extensive list of injuries. There was still a lot of ongoing surgeries that needed to, to take place. And I, my life was hanging in a balance constantly. Uh, and it was a credit to the, the medical team here at the Royal that they were able to keep me going day in, day out, even though the odds, even at that stage, I was still given less than 1% chance of surviving. And through this process, of course, they're trying to uh, resolve the injuries from the accident. But unfortunately, as they started to as they started to come out of the uh, you know, out of that difficult scenario of recovering from those injuries, then I was unfortunately um, in a position where I contracted pneumonia and sepsis. So you can imagine a reasonably healthy person who might pick up one of those uh, illnesses, the chances of surviving you know, uh, are questionable, uh, particularly with uh, the onset of sepsis. Let alone somebody like me who had a a badly broken body, was critically ill, and then contracted those conditions. So where the infection started was in the, the wound to my back, so that's where I've hit the arm, we believe it's where I hit the arm guard rail. And what doctors noticed is that uh, my kidneys started to shut down. And because I was so unstable, being able to move me to actually do an examination, I understand, was quite difficult. So they eventually found that the infection had spread from that wound, and you can see in the second shot there, it's quite dark, so I believe that's uh, the infection taking hold. And so a decision was made that, as well as obviously the treatment with antibiotics and so on, it, the, the uh, condition had become so deteriorated so badly that the decision was made that they would have to remove a lot of the infected tissue around the wound. And so you see the hole I started with in the, in the initial injury to what I ended up with um, as we have today, where a lot of that was removed. And so it's only through some incredible work here at the hospital that I was able to survive that infection. And still today, when I think back of how ill I was before I contracted the, the, the sepsis and then being able to survive that, it is absolutely phenomenal and a testimony to the, the great work here at the hospital. And... Through the process of all this, right, I, I see all the attentions on me, Daryl, the patient, but there's another set of patients, really, because it's the family uh, who are heavily traumatised. They're on this roller coaster ride. As I said, Julie had to fly back from Belgium uh, and then arrive here in ICU. You're unprepared as to what you're going to expect when you arrive. And then to, living, to live on this daily roller coaster ride, is Daryl going to live or is he going to die? And she tells me a funny story of, you know, she's a Belgian national and uh, not used to Australian uh, sayings or idioms. And uh, doctors would call my family into for the meeting room. They hated that, that meeting because they never knew whether they were going to get bad news or good news. And so they always went in there quite anxious. And uh, even on the days where they were receiving good news that uh, my condition was improving, uh, doctors would say, but he's not out of the woods yet. And so Julie used to think to herself, what the heck's the forest got to do with his survival? <laughs> and, uh, but, but it's, sort of, it's, it's funny now when I look back at it, but it's interesting because communication uh, to the families is obviously one of those challenging things for, for us to look at because my family would go in there and hear the same information from the same doctor and walk out of that room with three different versions of it because of the, the stress state they were in, what they were hearing, and the way they filtered that information. And so for the family, it just adds to the stress, this um, uncertainty as to what is ahead of them. So I managed to escape ICU after 35 days, and that was always my mission, to get out of there as quickly as possible once I did wake up. And obviously the operations continued. I, I showed you that large wound from where the, the infected tissue was cut away. 
Uh, so I went, underwent major skin grafts. And through this process, you know, I had this sort of love-hate relationship with the physios. I'm not sure whether they hated me and I loved them or it was the other way around. But it was that, I remember the physio was excruciating and that was a very difficult thing for me. But when you've got such a badly broken body, you start to, uh, over time, start to realise this incredible journey I had ahead of me. This, and to me, it was like this mountain I had to climb. And so I always think of it as my mental Everest. How was I going to navigate my way to the top of that mountain? And to look at, at it at the top of the mountain at that state I was in, uh, it was overwhelming. And you, I, for the first time in my life, I, understand, I understood why people gave up the will to live because you're so weak and to survive it and get out the other end, it was going to require so much energy and so much strength. You know, I thought, have I got enough to do this? And so the way I, did, I survived it was to not look at the top of the mountain, but to look right in front of me. And I developed all these little short-term goals so that it's like a peg in a mountain, one peg at a time, and the short-term achievable goals, and as I achieved them, I started to wind my way up that mountain. And six years on, that's still how I, I uh, approach this. But I'm a long way, for, a lot further up that mountain than I was six years ago. The interesting thing about surviving uh, things like you know, an accident and overcoming sepsis is that through this whole process, uh, life goes on. So your family is exposed to uh, the impact of that accident in a, in a number of different ways. So when I finally made it home uh, from hospital, uh, my relationship with my wife went from husband and wife to uh, patient care or patient nurse. Uh, the relationship I had with my baby daughter changed because I was an observer in her life. I couldn't interact with her. I was on, on, on the bed. I was in a lounge chair. Uh, I think she was about three years of age before I was able, strong enough to be able to pick her up. And so it impacts everybody around you. And, of course, you know, I wasn't working, so I wasn't getting paid. My wife was on maternity leave at the time. She had to go back and work part-time. So the income stops, the bills increase because you get medical bills coming in now. And you have all this uncertainty around, you know, your career, will I be able to return to work? What sort of career will I have? And in our case, it was also a legal battle because there was a criminal charge laid against the driver of the vehicle that hit us. That was a two-year journey we were on. Then we have the civil case. That was a five-year process. And I would say personally that, that the legal case, the civil case, was actually more traumatic to me mentally than the accident itself. And that's something I would like to see change in the future. And so that's a quick snapshot of life consequences. But for me, there were obviously complications and ongoing challenges physically. And so for me, probably the biggest one is this picture up here where... Where the hole was, where all the uh, tissue had been removed, my body decided, well, we'll, we'll fill that up with something. So uh, I've experienced this um, condition you're sure you're familiar with called heterotopic ossification, where the spine and bone growth um, set up resonance in my body. And that's a, to explain what that feels like. It's like having a piece of plywood stuck in your back. Fortunately, some of that's been able to be removed now, so it's given me a little bit more freedom and mobility. But you also have to deal with the ongoing issues of chronic pain, chronic fatigue. Those things are always there. And I know in a very short period of time I've cap captured several months and several minutes. Uh, but the thing I want to highlight here is that throughout my journey, the reason I'm able to come and speak to you today is simply this. That the people at the accident scene, the, the paramedics, uh, the surgeons who operated on me, the ICU doctors, intensivists, nurses, everybody against incredible odds, didn't give up. Now, there's plenty of times where they could have made a decision to give up, and they didn't. And the interesting thing is that by not giving up and saving my life, they actually had a very positive impact on the people around me. I showed you some photographs of Julie and my daughter. So in that photograph there that you're looking at, that's my daughter Sienna's second birthday. And if it wasn't for the team here, I wouldn't be standing in that photograph. And she would have grown, out with, grown up without her father. And so everything that happened to, to my journey was based on not only effort by people, but also research. The way I was treated at the accident scene, five years previous I would have died at the accident scene because the treatment was very different. The red blanket protocol, 
It's all based on research on how we process critical ill patients when they arrive at the hospital. The drugs, the way I was treated in ICU is based on research. Everything is based on research and then coupled with uh, incredibly talented, dedicated people. And so in my case, we saved one person and impacted many. But I believe through uh, research and through CRE Reduce that we can save many people and in doing so, maybe impact this world. Thank you.